So um, my name is Christina Ho, and I'm um, going to help facilitate and moderate um, today. And it may, may seem a little odd. I'm actually not an IP person by trade or practice, but um, I um, am someone who has uh, monitored um, prescription drug prices for a very long time. Um, from when I worked on the House side for John Tierney, and then when I worked on the Senate side for um, Hillary Clinton when she was senator from New York. Um, and when I worked in the White House for Bill Clinton um, at the Domestic Policy Council, and now I teach at Rutgers. Um, and I teach health law, I teach food and drug law. Um, so we have a really incredible um, group of um, panelists here. And then, um, you know, I'll defer to Dana, but I th let me just give you a sense of roughly how we want to spend the time, because we want it to be fairly interactive. Um, and we can <coughs> kind of change this up um, in terms of sort of how things progress. But um, you know, we, I want to tee up the issue for our folks here, um, and I will introduce um, them in turn quite shortly. And I think we're going to have folks maybe give sort of five minutes um, of just sort of scoping out um, what we want to talk about today um, from their perspective. Um, but then very short, so five minutes each, and then we're going to go into questions. And what I'd like to do is um, maybe sort of you know, one for me, one for you. So, you know, I might ask folks a question and then, you know, if, if you know, I would take one from the audience and if, you know, and we'll see, um, and we'll see how it goes from there. Um, and that way the conversation can head in a direction um, that um, uh, we collectively decide. So, um, without further ado, um, let me introduce first um, our panelists today, um, many of whom you already know, but, um, but uh, really sort of um, a wonderful group of people and hopefully they'll, I think, I'm sure there'll be a, a sort of really rich co conversation um, from various people's um, expertise. So Charles Duan, um, to my left, is a senior fellow and associate director of tech and innovation policy at the R Street Institute, as you know. Um, and here he focuses on intellectual property issues. He's filed amicus briefs um, on patents with the Supreme Court um, and federal appeals courts, filed comments with the USPTO, testified before Congress um, on patents. So um, his influence is across all three branches of government. And before joining our street um, in January 2018, Charles was um, the director of the Patent Reform Project at Public Knowledge, where he handled all aspects of patent policy. Um, he served as a research fellow with Professor Paul Ohm, um, and he has also worked uh, in private practice as a patent attorney um, at Knob Martins. Um, he is the author of a five-part plan for patent reform, um, published in 2014. Um, he, his undergraduate degree was in computer science from Harvard College, and his um, law degree was from Harvard Law School. Um, so he brings sort of a variety of experiences to bear. Um, and then Rachel Scher, whom I feel like I should have known from before, but uh, we have never really crossed paths, um, is Deputy General Counsel at the Association for Accessible Medicines, um, industry trade group of members with an interest in generic and biosimilar medicines in the U.S. Um, prior to that, she was at the FDA, where she was this, a senior policy analyst in the Commissioner's Office of Policy. And in that capacity, um, she was the FDA lead on the 21st Century Cures Act. And then for 10 years prior to that, um, Mitchell served as senior FDA counsel for Congressman Henry Waxman, who was chair and then ranking member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, she drafted and negotiated major FDA legislation. Um, it's really sort of quite a litany, right? Dr Drug Quality and Safety Act, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act, Fedazia, um, BPCIA, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act, which was enacted as part of the Affordable Care Act um, in 2010, the Food Safety and Modernization Act, and the FDA Amendments Act of 2007. And Rachel has both a JD and an MPH. Her MPH is from George Washington University School of Public Health, JD from the University of Florida, um, and her undergrad institution is Duke. And then finally, last but not least, Tahir. Um, so I actually first met Tahir when um, I, was, I was working in China for the Clinton Foundation. Um, we were rolling at helping the Chinese government roll out uh, antiretroviral treatment for um, people living with HIV AIDS. Um, this was in the mid-aughts. And um, you know, the Chinese were, were desperate, really, for people to kind of give them international um, sort of not a knowledge base to draw from and international examples. And, and Tahir, um, his, uh, you know, his presence was, um, was 
phenomenal because they were able to sort of glean, well, these are things that India has done, these are things that have happened in the UK, this is what Brazil is doing, so from all over the world. Um, he is the co-founder and director of Initiative for Medicines, Access, and Knowledge. Um, he has practiced as a solicitor for the senior courts of England and Wales with two of the leading IP firms in the UK and also served as in-house global IP manager for a multinational company. He has nearly 20 years of IP experience um, overseeing multi-country IP work um, for a decade in the private sector and then now brings that depth of experience into the public interest space. Prior to co-founding IMAC in 2006, uh, he, has, he spent two years in India researching public interest IP issues and working on pharmaceutical patent oppositions. So he is um, really a thought leader in um, intellectual property patent um, and treatment issues uh, and therefore has served as a legal advisor and consultant to, you know, you name it, um, the WHO, Gabi, Unitaid, certainly the Clinton Foundation when I worked there, um, the, HIV, uh, the Doctors, Doctors Without Borders, Oxfam, International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development, um, UNEP, the European Patent Office, um, and uh, he was a fellow at Harvard Medical School in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Um, he was an Equine Green Fellow in uh, 2008, a TED Fellow in 2009, um, a adjunct faculty member at St. Luke Foundation Kilimanjaro School of Medicine, and in 2012, Mr. Amin was the, was the pres recipient of the South Asian Bar Association of New York's Legal Trailblazer Award. So. Um, so with that, um, let's talk about patents and drug prices, right? So drug prices have been in the news. Um, I sort of continue to be amazed that they managed to break through given everything else that's in the news. Um, but uh, it's an important issue. As I said, I've followed it over time, but it's not a new issue. Um, here we are still spending about a billion dollars a day on pharmaceuticals, um, retail pharmaceuticals, more if you count um, you know, in-office uh, pharmaceutical expenditures. Prescription drug spending in Medicare will grow faster than any other type of Medicare benefit over the next 10 years. Um, one in four people taking prescription drugs say they have trouble affording them. 80% of people polled by, um, this was a Kaiser, I think it was Kaiser uh, polling data, said they think drug prices are too high and 52% of the respondents said passing legislation to bring down the price of prescription drugs is a top priority for pre the president and for Congress. Higher priority in their view than passing an infrastructure bill, than DACA, <coughs> than addressing the opiate epidemic, um, than repealing the Affordable Care Act, higher priority than the border wall. Um, and this is something that um, you know, just reflects what I always used to say um, to Senator Clinton. It's such a pocketbook issue for middle class folks, right, because it's a symbol of um, whether our economic system and our way of life works for them and for their loved ones. Um, and so, you know, I think some of our um, panelists, Charles, may talk about sort of why should people pay attention to patents? Why should people care about patents, right? So prescription drugs becomes a very visible um, manifestation of why people should care about patents. Um, so I teach administrative law, and I sometimes ask my students, right, to try to think about problems in terms of whether they are um, expressions of market failure or regulatory failure, right? And of course it's never that, you know, reductive, right? Um, and here it's not that reductive either. So we want the markets to work, and we want them to work much, much better than they work now, right? But they're dysfunctional, and why? in part because of a regulatory dysfunction, right? The, the government intervention that is at the root of all this, the monopoly granted um, you know, through, through a patent, is essentially the government using state power to exclude commercial activity by competitors and new entrants. Um, that's something that we need to explore. Um, and of course, you know, in many ways, FDA pre-market approval um, and the exclusivity that's afforded by that um, does something quite <coughs> similar. So the Constitution, of course, right, makes the um, uh, federal power over patents um, legitimate in order to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Are patents doing that? Um, and today, we're going to take a look at this. So there's been a lot of talk, I guess, about a number of other areas in the drug pricing um, realm. 
uh, certainly right to try, you know, um, has just passed. Um, you know, Secretary of HHS has just um, issued a plan about drug prices. Um, but a lot of these things are about maybe access without as much attention to the value side of the equation. Um, and so arguably, none of these conversations have gotten to the root of the matter, right, which is the government-granted monopoly. Um, and instead of promoting innovation, it's promoting regulatory gamesmanship. So in, instead of promoting the progress of science and the useful arts, it's promoting lawyering and business arrangements. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to turn to Charles um, and maybe sort of ask the question, so why is it that people haven't, re haven't really put, put it together, right, that patents mm. are at the root of this? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Christina. Um, you know, that was a great introduction and, you know, really great question. And also thanks to IMAC for helping to, to organize this, um, this really interesting panel um, on a topic that's, you know, I think should be a, should be a very um, important topic for a lot of people. Um, as Christina mentions, you know, drug prices are one of the big ticket items right now. Patents generally aren't something that are top of mind for people. I think that there's a sense that um, patent issues are ones that are dealt with, that big companies deal with. It's just, you know, um, you know, Google or it's Samsung fighting Apple over patents. And, you know, how does that really affect, you know, me, the individual consumer? Um, and the answer is that it does two things. Number one, a patent is a right to exclude. It's a right to prevent other com companies from entering the market. That's a right to basically block the free market from doing what it should do, lower prices that ultimately work better for, um, for individual consumers like you and me who end up having to pay the costs, directly or indirectly, of, of all of the litigation that goes on. Um, and I think that's in in the case of pat in the case of um, drug prices, this is probably one of the most obvious areas that that happens, right? You know, when you when you purchase a cell phone, you know, there are a lot of features that go into that, um, and it's hard to disentangle what's the you know what's the value of the patents that you're what are the patent license that you're paying versus what are the actual features that you're getting. But when it comes to drugs, a lot of times you know you have a generic version and you have the brand name version, you can just see what the price difference is, and otherwise the drugs are basically the same. Um, so that, I think, is a pretty clear-cut example of what happens when the government puts in this, um, this monopoly of a patent into, into the workings of a free market. It raises prices for people like you and me. Um, the second thing that a patent does is <coughs> it limits downstream innovation. So if one company has a patent on something, it prevents other companies from taking that same technology and improving on it, or coming up with new ideas, or you know, building building similar systems that are that are too close to the patent. Obviously, the the second downstream company is allowed to get more patents on um, on future innovation, but that doesn't translate into products. You know, you and I aren't enriched by there being more patents in the world. You and I are enriched by there being more products in the world and services in the world, and insofar as a patent can prevent companies from building those services, or even you or me from coming up with new products that we could ultimately create a startup around and bring to market. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty significant detriment to the overall, um, to the overall marketplace. Um, and I think you, know, you see that in the, um, in the pharmaceutical industry as well. You have a lot of companies that, uh, you have a lot of brand name companies that are ultimately resting on their laurels. They have their one big brand name drug and insofar as they're collecting royalties on them and making a lot of money, why should they put in the um, effort and the, the time to research new drugs? Um, especially when they can just go to the patent office, get small, you know, get patents on small improvements of them. And then say, you know, we're done for the day. We got another 20 years of exclusivity from the market. So patents have pretty big impacts on consumers. And I think that in the space of drugs and drug prices, that's nowhere, um, that, that's nowhere more prominent. Um, I think this is an important issue also because it's a very good bipartisan issue. On the one hand, when you, when you limit the overbearingness of the patent system in ways that are incorrect, you are helping consumers. Um, at the same time, you're also helping the free market work. I'm fairly fond of saying that the, you know, the value of a 
carefully crafted patent system is that it protects consumer interests in the free market. That's something that everybody should be um, agreeing with. And particularly when we see that competition works in the generic markets, it makes a lot of sense to say <coughs> that free market um, competition ends up benefiting everybody, especially consumers. Thank you. Um, so let's turn to Rachel. And um, I guess sort of, Rachel, what, what, um, what are the members um, who have an interest in generics and biosimilars, what are, they, what are they thinking about this issue now? And what are the big challenges that they confront? Um, thanks, and thanks for um, moderating. And thank you to our street and IMAC for hosting this. Um, let me just take a little step back and just give a little bit of background on the generic industry itself. I think, by all accounts, the generic drug industry is a major success. The 1984 Hatch-Waxman amendments essentially gave the generic drug industry its start. And since that time, when there was approximately 20% generics on the market, we've grown now to represent over 90% of the prescriptions filled, um, but only account for 26% of the drug expenditure. And in 2016, we saved the US uh, $253 billion. I think, again, success story. Um, we are also a major source of new jobs in the United States. In 2016, our industry manufactured over 61 billion doses and employed over 36,000 people in the United States. We would say that a robust generic drug industry is the best way to meet what is now the president's stated goal for lowering drug prices. Um, the one point I want to really convey, getting to your question, Christina, is that our companies are also pro-innovation. Um, without innovation in the brand side, there would be no innovation or generic market, period. Um, so we definitely think there is a problem in the patent system as it exists today, but we are not here to say that there shouldn't be patent protection. Um, what we are seeing in spades is brand companies that make minor tweaks to products and get additional patents added that don't represent true innovation that, that actually warrants that additional 20-year term. Um, and it's an enormous problem, as, as we're here to talk about tonight. It's driving up costs for consumers, and it's something we all need to be worried about. Um, obviously, the PTO has a critical role to be playing in this because they're the ones that are issuing the patents in the first place. Um, the, the sort of poster child of this phenomenon that we always talk about is Humira. That is a drug that is the best-selling drug globally. It makes $16 billion in annual U.S. sales which AAM likes to say, because we're very fond of sports analogies, is more than the revenue of all NFL teams combined. So just in case that helps with your reference point. It doesn't help mine, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, Humira was approved in 2002, and the biologic exclusivity that was awarded as part of the BPCIA expired in 2014. The initial compound patent on that product expired in 2016. And in the three years prior to 2016, the company was successful at obtaining an additional 75 patents, um, which brought the effective patent, light out, patent life out to 2034. There's since been patent litigation or patent settlements that would allow a generic on the market in the US in 2023 and in the EU in 2018. But already there's been one patent that was invalidated through the Interpartes review process, which we'll talk about. Um, and there are literally dozens of manufacturing patents. So the likelihood that those 75 additional patents issued that late in the product's life cycle represent what I think we would all agree as being true innovation, I think is pretty slim. Um, we know that the practices and sort of resources at the PTO are part of this dynamic. Um, one study showed that the PTO examiners spend on average just 19 hours per application. And 
that's, you know, each examiner obviously is responsible for reviewing dozens and dozens of um, caseloads and sifting through an immense amount of complex information on the prior art that exists. So what are the solutions? Um, I think that's one of the reasons we're all here today. And I can tell you that there is a growing consensus among stakeholders and on the Hill that it's time to address the abuses that we're seeing here. On the Hill, you see um, members on a bipartisan basis, including Senators Cotton, Hassan, Patty Murray, um, Senator Paul, all political shapes and stripes um, coming together in various ways to address the problem. You're also seeing, um, I think, some pretty unprecedented statements coming from this administration. Um, Secretary Azar has been out there saying that um, we need to fight the gaming in the system by patents and exclusivity agreements. Um, he was also on Squawk Box a couple weeks ago saying there was a deal as to biosimilars deal that was made and at 12 years, he used the phrase, Katie bar the door, there should be generic and biosimilar competition. Um, you're also seeing unprecedented statements from the commissioner of FDA who has been out all over the place talking about how it's time to end the shenanigans by brand drunk companies. So this is the time to start thinking about these solutions. Um, one of the main areas we've focused on that we feel is critical is maintaining a strong IPR inter partes review uh, system at the PTO. Um, Congress established or codified this process. It had been in existence long before in the 2012 America Invents Act. Um, and Congress recognized the same thing that we were just talking about, that the patent examiners are burdened and have a difficult time reviewing the reams of data that are out there pertaining to prior art, and sometimes mistakes are made. So. The core essence of the IPR program is to give the PTO a chance to take a second look at its own decisions to issue the patents in the first place. Um, Congress wanted it to be a streamlined system with efficient mechanisms built in for reviewing the patents. Um, and so we think that it's critical that the system be maintained. Um, the main ways we are going about this are, first and foremost, opposing loopholes in this process. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard about the Allergan situation where the drug was approved, um, Restasis, approved in, 20, in 2003. Uh, in 2016, had $1.6 billion in revenue. And just before the patents were set to expire in 2014, Argan came in and obtained a dozen new patents that don't expire until 2024. Um, these are patents that it's attempted to claim essentially the same um, formulation and methods of treatment that were previously claimed in the prior patents. Um, Argan sued the generics, and generics brought an IPR case one week before the IPR um, hearing was set to begin, Argan paid the St. Regis Mohawk tribe $13.7 million plus $15 million annually to take ownership of the patents and lease them back to Allergan, trying to assert their sovereign immunity in the context of the IPR process. Um, that, that decision has been, the PTAB ultimately uh, disagreed with Allergan, said sovereign immunity doesn't apply in IPR uh, proceedings. That decision is up on appeal, and they just had oral arguments uh, this week. And from what I've heard, it was a very uh, heated argument all around. Um, there is legislation pending in Congress called the PACE Act, which we support that would close this loophole and say that sovereign immunity cannot be a bar to the PTAB or um, this hasn't been done yet, but um, it, it being used in federal circuit court, too, for review in the Hatch-Waxman litigation. Um, there's also, a, a se separate from the sort of Allergan situation, there is other pending litigation that we're very concerned about that we believe would weaken the IPR process called the Stronger Patents Act. Um, essentially, the byproduct of 
that legislation would be to render the IPR process much more similar to district court litigation. So essentially nullifying all the benefits that Congress sought to create when it established the process in the, a in the America Events Act. Um, there are also some concerning um, things coming out of the PTO itself. There's a proposed rule that was just issued, again, with changes that we're very concerned would weaken the IPR process. We're in the process of submitting comments and would urge anyone else who is concerned to take a look at that and make sure you also get your voices heard on that. Um, other solutions are out there. To be clear, these are not ones that AEM necessarily supports, but to put them out there for purposes of discussion. Um, Professor Robin Feldman has suggested a sort of one and done system that uh, essentially would say to the brands, you have to pick. You either get patents to protect your product or you get <coughs> terms of exclusivity. I mean, I think that, that system where the brands get both exclusivity and patent protection is one that makes the pharmaceutical industry stand alone. And we don't have that in all the other um, industries that, that make use of the IPR process or that have patents in general. Um, so that would be one solution. Um, others that have been out there, and this pertains to um, biosimilars to start the, the patent dance that occurs in the Biosimilars Act earlier. Um, that would potentially end up making the litigation that ensues end earlier, earlier and allow the biosimilar ultimately to come on the market sooner. Um, my former boss, Henry Waxman, has also suggested um, recently that one thing that needs to be looked at is uh, uh, eliminating the 30-month stay that was established in Hatch-Waxman. Um, and you know, giving generics sometimes the opportunity, especially in the face of patents that are potentially invalid, um, to launch at risk. Um, so those are some of the other solutions. There are many more, um, but we are excited to be a part of this conversation. I mean, I think, uh, the, as I said, the time is now, and we look forward to working with anyone to come up with solutions to address what I think everybody recognizes is a, a major problem for patients and consumers in this country. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and uh, now let's turn to Tahir. Tahir, what, what is IMAX's perspective on all of this? And you've been intervening very directly in, in some concrete ways. Thank you, Christina. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Charles for hosting this event. Uh, the work of my colleague Dana, who's at the back there, I believe, sat on the couch, um, for putting all this together. And for all of you to come here, I believe there's an ice hockey game on, so some of you would, might prefer to be there, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Just listening to everything that said, I, I want to come from maybe slightly an international perspective, but then also coming here in the work that we've been doing here. I, I think when we look at the Constitution, which you probably know better than I do, given that I'm not an American, uh, it says uh, progress of science for limited times. And when I look at how the patent system is working today, uh, and you talk about the estates, that are being built around Humera, which can last way beyond the sort of limited time that I think the fathers intended that the Constitution apply in this sense. We don't live in that world anymore. Uh, and I think from the work that IMAC has done over the years, we've landscaped a number of patent estates and portfolios, and we see this as a, an endemic problem within the patent system. And I think there's this Particularly, there's this, there's this sort of mythos around the idea of a patent that sort of, and it's to Christina's point about the value around it. The moment you get a patent is the moment that you attach some new value to it because there was an investment in it and therefore it's worth the price that comes with it. And then when you look at what, the, what is actually going into this, the, the, the product itself, whether it's actually scientifically inventive, it's uh, often not the case. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen the erosion of standards of patentability over the years, largely at the behest of a lot of the lobbying, the way the case law has gone, I think, since the 80s. At least uh, we've seen the, uh, the, the, the courts in the United States start applying a lower and lower standard. I think what's interesting, and just given the success of Hatch-Waxman, uh, prior to that generics, there was really no generic market because they had to do trials themselves. 
But Hatch-Waxman, in a way, as, as good as it was, has actually created the conundrum we're in today. Because if you look at the studies, the proliferation of patents emerged post-Hatch-Waxman. So once, basically, you could challenge uh, a patent, the company started actually adding these secondary patents, these tertiary patents. And so data shows that actually the growth of patents on drugs happened post-Hatch-Waxman. Which then leads me to believe that actually this is a business strategy, and I know that as a practicing attorney as well. And when you look at uh, some of the reports that are out there, for example, the European Competition Commission report, where they did an investigation into the pharmaceutical sector in Europe, and they did a discovery, they raided some of the offices, and they actually found emails from CEOs or legal departments saying, yeah, we don't think we're going to get this patent, but we're going to put it in there anyway because we just want to block the competition. And this is the world that we live in. Uh, it's a game. It's actually not playing the way it should be played. And I think, call it regulatory failure, uh, I think it's actually, um, I think there's too much attachment to the word innovation at the moment. That's actually, pharmaceutical companies are hiding behind the term innovation because it creates fear when we say, if we take these rights away, oh, well, there's not going to be no new drugs. And well, what innovation are we talking about? Because if you look at a number of the patents when challenged, they get actually rejected. But you have to go through this transactional process of not only reviewing the entire patent thickets that get created, but then you have to then challenge them. And you spend hours, you know, years in court getting through these 30-month stays or in, even with the streamlined process of the IPRs. And all this is amounting to profits which are going into the, the, the companies, but at the expense of consumers. So our view is actually we need to really visit what is the core principles of the patent system, and I think some of the suggestions that were made by Rachel we agree with. I also believe actually we need to start unpacking uh, uh, better standards of what is obvious, because I think the law is out of date to where science is today. And I'd like to quote a, um, a UK high, high, high Court judge, uh, Justice Laddie, who's now deceased, and he was the leading IP judge in the United Kingdom. And uh, I would say probably one of the smartest people I've ever come across on the IP debate. And he wrote a small sort of paper which he gave a speech about in London in 2004. And he said, what's invention got to do with it? And he said, most science today is obvious, given where we are in the scheme of things. But he recognized that you need investment in the model in order to get these new drugs. So then that raises a question to me is, and is the patent system actually, does it, is it needed or do we just need a different mechanism that incentivizes investment? Because investment is not invention. That's a different issue. The, the pharmaceutical system, or the patent system is about invention. That is the criteria. It has to be new, it has to be non-obvious, it has to have utility, and it has to have some written description that explains the invention. Unfortunately today, I don't think we think about the term invention anymore. We just think Let's, we want the investment, and that's fair. We, we want products. We want these new medical therapies. And if, if the patent system is delivering on that, which, if you look at some data, for example, Robin Feldman has said that 74% uh, of uh, drugs attached to new patents are already there. And then you look at a study in Europe where 51% of a study of 1,345 uh, new, new, med new medicines on the market, actually, there were just slight modifications with no added therapeutic value. So what kind of invention, or if you want to use that broader term, innovation, which I think are distinct, is distinctly different to invention from a legal point of view. Innovation is actually the commercialization of an invention. And that incorporates all sorts of things like marketing and all these other aspects. It's not actually inventing something. So I think we really need to unpack these terms and really start to think about them. In a, they might sound semantics, but actually they pay a huge cost on society. And I think we, we get so addicted to the term innovation that we forget actually what we were rewarding because we think it's progress all the time and, and as we've seen in a lot of studies there's no progress there and we're paying out of our nose for these things so from my perspective I think really we need to revisit what is obviousness because as a practicing attorney I think there is no obviousness standard it is so literally virtually novelty and that really then makes it harder to challenge a patent for example and I don't want to get into science geek but if you look at a crystallized form of a compound, a crystallized, a crystallized pattern, these are things that are inherently founded in a compound, in a small molecule. And given how screening happens today, maybe 20, 30 years ago, it was fine to say this was something new. But now, companies use screening technology. It's like running software. 
but we're still giving the same rewards 20 years for something that actually may have been inventive 20, 30 years ago, but now is actually just standard practice. And these kind of patents actually eke out longer periods and keep generics off the market, which then we have to pay higher prices for. And I feel there's a fear within, uh, given, given, the, the, given the way the Constitution holds on to the importance of patents, there's a fear to tackle it, because it means then the economy won't be strong, there won't be jobs, there'll be all these other problems. And that, to me, then becomes another reason to kind of question the term innovation. Are you talking about innovation in terms of progress? Or are you talking innovation in terms of getting jobs, economy? Those are two different things. So what are we rewarding here? I mean, if you want, if you want the patent system just to be an eco economic driver, then say so. Don't talk about its progress and science and new drugs and stuff like that. So let's have a really honest debate about what does it really mean to have the patent system and what is it intended for. Um, now, some of that is academic, but some of it is very practical because it's affecting so many people's lives. Um, well, thank you. And um, I want to, as I listen to the stories that you three tell, I guess I, I, I'm left with an impression of drift, right? That um, there was this sort of original consensus as to what the system should accomplish. Um, and then over time, things come unmoored, right? And they sort of deviate from the original purpose and the intent. And when that happens, right, we do kind of a whack-a-mole, right? So then there's a, there's a little something to address the, um, you know, the RAMS abuse, or then we, you know, we try to do something to, um, uh, you know, address the sovereign immunity abuse, right? But there's always a lag, right? So you can't ever quite sort of catch up to to how, how quickly this is drifting off course. So I guess I'm sort of curious, is there something to attack this, the core source of the drift? Is there something that's sort of systemic so that, um, you know, we, we are, we're not sort of always chasing after, I, I think what is it, essentially it's a political economy issue, right? The reason there's drift is because there's so much money at stake. Um, so so I, I'd yeah, be well, curious. So, you know, I, I kind of want to, you know, answer that and follow up on uh, what Tahir was talking about toward the end about this, this, this sort of question of, like, the obvious standard in patents, which I think is one of the most important issues that nobody really wants to talk about uh, when, it comes to, when, it, when it comes to patents. Um, as Tahir mentions, a patent is a, is a very, very valuable reward. It's a 20-year exclusivity. It cuts off free market competition for almost two decades. Um, what, what was originally intended to be um, two terms of an apprenticeship, which has been expanded over time by a number of years. Um, to merit such an award, you ought to have made some fairly substantial improvements um, to, the state of the to the state of knowledge of the public. Um, that's why the Constitution says that the patent system exists to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Um, if you're not promoting the science and the useful arts, then why is Congress issuing you a patent? Um, the standard as it's written um, in the law I think is actually pretty good. It says that a patent should not, uh, or a, a patent shouldn't issue on an invention that would have been obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art um, at the time that the invention was made. So you know, if you know, ordinary college engineer uh, a co or a college <coughs> biochemist could have come up with that drug um, based on what was the state of the art at the time, then you know, there's no reason to give somebody a patent on, on that should be given to an extraordinary invention. Um, what's happened is that over time, um, Congress, I think, has to some extent tried to avoid dealing with the particular technicalities of what counts as obvious and what doesn't count as obvious. So they mostly left this to the courts. Um, and at least in the hands of the federal circuits, um, they've really cut back on the ability to prove that a patent is obvious um, through sort of procedural and evidentiary requirements. And these are, these are fairly interesting. There's a, there's a case that I was following um, about a year ago um, called Millennium Pharmaceuticals. I, I forget the particular drug that was at issue, but the, the drug itself was no longer um, under patent. A second patent had been obtained on it, uh, on, on the drug, um, freeze-dried, combined with a bulking agent that would help it to be freeze-dried. 
Um, the prior art, which was the inventor's actual own disclosure, said that freeze-drying the drug would probably be a good idea. And it said, there are only seven bulking agents out there that you can use. And this one's the best one. The second patent, of course, claims that bulking agent and freeze drying. So, you know, what's what's special about this? Well, it turns out that when you make that compound, it works better than expected. Um, it turns out that it forms some sort of some sort of special molecule. I'm not exactly sure what. And the Federal Circuit said, well, because you happen to be lucky, you get the patent. That's not obvious. This is literally the thing that the prior art that the existing science told people to try. The Supreme Court has said in KSR that when something is obvious to try, that should be obvious and the patent should not grant on that. Yet by creating this sort of procedural rule that if somehow you can show that there's some sort of later result and that the prior art didn't teach the specific named method or the, the specific named compound, <coughs> that you can get a patent on that. That has really driven this industry of trying to obtain patents on very, very small incremental inventions um, that really don't represent the, the best of American um, innovation or research and development. That I think, what, I mean, what does that tell um, American businesses? That they should spend a lot of time investing in complex breakthrough discoveries? Or that they should just go to the patent office and say, here's a small change, we get another 20 years. I think the incentives are pretty clear at this point. The facts make pretty clear that that's what's happening. And it's pretty unfortunate that this is what's going on. Um, unfortunately, I think what's happened is that Congress doesn't really want to tackle this issue because it just seems too odd and wonky and they've more or less left to the courts. Um, which means that when it comes to institutions, um, the courts have really been where it's at when it comes to a lot of patent reform issues. We've seen the Supreme Court make a number of very, very important decisions on, on, um, on core patent questions. Um, the Solicitor General filed a brief saying that the Supreme Court probably should take a look at this obviousness issue. It's, it's pretty wrong right now, they said in a brief. Um, but it means that the advocacy, I think, is a little different from what people are expecting. That you know, amicus briefs tend to be the game rather than um, congressional hills, um, hill meetings or proposed legislation. Um, and that's a, it, it's an interesting effort. Um, I think the, the IPRs that Tahir is filing and that IMAC are filing are actually a really important aspect of this because in a lot of other areas, we found that impact litigation is really crucial to the development of the law. We haven't really seen so much impact litigation in patents, uh, in patents despite the fact that a number of academics have called for this. I think that Megan LaBelle at Catholic University has written several articles saying that we need to have, you know, um, public interest organizations looking at patents as a public problem. Um, so I'd actually be interested in hearing kind of what your experiences have been like uh, with regard to the IPRs that you filed. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Charles. I think you uh, really succinctly uh, explained everything <laughs> that I just sort of just titled. Um, so I appreciate that. Yes, so IMAC has been involved in filing IPRs. Uh, we've made conducted patent challenges around the world and uh, uh, just last year we started uh, looking at the IPR system and then filed a number of challenges on the drug Savaldi which is the hepatitis C drug uh, or cure as some like to say the gentleman reminded me of that um, and uh, so far we have not been successful in getting instituted in four of the cases um, and largely because of this obviousness standard in our mind um, because it, it is essentially a novelty standard which is a much narrower uh, requirement which says basically uh, you can only say something is lacking novelty if it's specifically explained and then the obvious standard is supposed to be a bit broad, much broader than that but it's not it's virtually if it's not explained then you're in the same boat um, and so in that sense it's, it's been a bit of a challenge uh, but just picking up on something you know the impact litigation is a good good point you made because as I was thinking about uh, some of the issues on the table, one of the things that strikes me, and again, I look at it from both an international perspective, but also what's happening here in the United States given the drug pricing crisis, is that uh, how can you have impact litigation if public interest groups or other actors who are non-commercial actors don't have legal standing in court? And that is the reality of the United States today. Unless you're actually sued for infringement, then you don't actually have legal standing. 
So really then it becomes a playground for those who have the wealth, who are commercial actors. There's no public voice in the patent system. The IPR is the only saving grace, and even that's not cheap. You're spending at least $400,000, $500,000. Um, so that begs the question of then, who's, who's really getting to decide what the law is? And as somebody who's practiced law, and any lawyers amongst us who I know there are a few, that's how the law gets created. You can write whatever you want on legislation, but the implementation, and we've seen this world over, the implementation is what matters because you then define what those words mean. You then define what the standards are because you keep going in, you keep going in, you keep going in, and you keep getting it until you get it, what you want. So where's the public voice in this? And the, the, the courts don't allow this. So one of our uh, suggestions is that basically that needs to be changed. Uh, and I think there's a potential there where um, one company recently lost an IPR and it wants to appeal because you can't appeal from an IPR challenge if you lose to the courts. Only the actual patent holder can. And so unless there's an infringement action going on. And uh, uh, there's a case where we're thinking now that there could be a challenge to that and uh, an application for cert to the Supreme Court. Um, and I think it would be very important for anybody who wants to open up the legal space for other actors to get on board with that amicus. Because uh, even some generic companies have actually fallen down that where they actually had a product in the planning, but they, they basically weren't technically infringing and couldn't appeal. So this could potentially affect even people who are in discovery stage. Or So it's not just public interest, it's actually broad. It could have actually people are doing research and stuff because they're not technically infringing. So. That for me is actually, it, it's incredulous that, to think that, uh, and but there are countries around the world where actually there's been a deliberate attempt to reduce the amount of uh, 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 entry for other actors into the thing. Because in other, in other countries, they use, you have to be a person interested, and then there's a commercial definition to that. And if you look at the United Kingdom, in, 1940, in its 1949 act, it used to be open to everyone. Then it got stripped away in the late 70s. And you can see the power of the pharmaceutical lobby to actually achieve these goals in terms of trimming the laws for their needs and leaving out the rest of us, who then, if we've got a, if we've got a gripe, we can't do anything about it. Rachel, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I mean, to your sort of original point about sort of always playing catch up that these laws get passed and then defects are found or loopholes are discovered that are then exploited, I mean, I think we have seen that over and over and over again. Um, as much as, legislator, as legislators try to anticipate problems with the ways that the laws are written when they're being drafted and negotiated and ultimately enacted, there are things that are missed. And once they're in law, it's incredibly difficult to go back and change them. And it does take years. And so I think when we're talking about changes changes like the ones we're discussing that we may all agree um, are necessary to the patent law itself, we have to remember that when you're talking about going to Congress to try to get the law changed, that is just going to take a Herculean effort. Um, not to mention that this is, you know, I, I assume what we're talking about when we're talking about making these changes is there are going to be changes that apply across all industries, not just to the pharmaceutical industry. So that brings in just a host of other stakeholders, obviously. Um, that, to me, is why I think we need to, as I mentioned, think about maintaining the tools that we do have in law now, maintaining a strong IPR process, resisting efforts to get new legislation passed that would wake, weaken the IPR, and as I mentioned, really thinking through how to approach what's going on at the PTO, whether it is getting an infusion of resources to the PTO, whether it is um, educating the examiners about the prior art that's out there, educating the examiners about the obviousness standard. I mean, I'm not a patent attorney, so I don't know the, the sort of universe of steps that would be out there, but it, it definitely seems like the, the initial issuance of a patent in many cases, as the IPR statistics have shown, shows that there are a lot of mistakes made, and that's what leads to the problems down the line and delays generic and biosimilar competition. So 
figuring out ways to address patents and ensure that only innovative patents are issued, I think is is what we can do with the tools that are readily available to us. I think you know thinking about changes to legislation is a uh, you know obviously the legislative year for all to intents and purposes for big new legislation is coming to a close pretty soon this year, so that already puts us into next year. Um, so I think thinking through what we can do now is is really important. Um, okay, so your turn. Do folks have questions that um, they'd like to ask? And, you know, I don't know if there's a microphone out there, um, but if there isn't, I will repeat your question just so it's um, recorded for the purposes of streaming. So just um, the question is about how um, can we think about the availability of the information on either patents or FDA approvals that have been rejected, not just the ones that have achieved approval, um, and whether um, making that information more widely available um, would sort of um, be an important reform. Believe it or not, there is a case right now um, pending. Uh, it was so it was it was um, before the federal circuit. Um, there was a request for them to rehear the case. Um, it's probably going to go on cert petition very soon on exactly this issue. Um, there's a there's this very odd situation that happens that where a um, where a patent application gets into the system, um, but doesn't get published for a while. Um, even though you know it might have been filed, you know, say like in 2005, but it gets published in 2007, um, it may not count as prior art against something that was filed in 2006, even though it was earlier than 2006. Um, and the Federal Circuit has basically come up with this very weird rule that says um, basically that in a lot of situations you're not allowed to count the thing from 2005. Um, so yeah, you know, it would be it would actually be very useful if there would be more information about you know what the what the patent office um, didn't didn't allow if they were actually to be considering it um, more. There is the competing interest of keeping things secret until the patent issues, but or until you know, until publication is allowed. Um, but yeah, this is this has actually caused problems a number of times, and it's fairly unfortunate. Um, the larger issue, though, is that. I think what you're basically pointing to is that there's this large body of prior art out there that isn't actually patents, that <clears throat> nevertheless ought to count when it comes to patent examination, that people ought to be looking at, that examiners ought to be, able, uh, ought to be looking at. Um, and the patent office faces a couple of problems. Number one is the access problem. You know, with the patent applications, they have them, but for a lot of these, they're just manuals on a shelf or um, college dissertations that somebody published in a small journal um, or, or um, research memos that somebody, that, you know, somebody put online. Um, a lot of times those are actually the best prior art. Part of this is because a lot of times when you're looking for the prior art that says that a patent shouldn't have granted, you need the stuff that is so dumb that nobody would have filed a patent application. Probably nobody would have filed a journal article about it. Um, there was a case that I looked at uh, called KSHIMPP versus Hearware, um, in which the Federal Circuit decided that a hearing aid, a certain type of hearing aid, was in the prior art. That the hearing aid attached to a wire was in the prior art. But what was not in the prior art was the hearing aid attached to a wire terminated with multiple prongs creating an electrical and communicative interface. What's that called? That's a plug. <laughs> the Federal Circuit literally said that adding a plug to a wire of a hearing aid rendered it patentable, right? Where do you find the prior art for that sort of thing? <laughs> um, and so, so, you know, like, the, um, the access problem, I think, is pretty serious. The legal challenge is pretty serious. And then finally is this, you know, 19 hours for examination. Um, I think the, the statistics range anywhere between, like, seven, 17 and 35 hours. It's not a lot of time. So even if the Patent Office did have all this information in front of it, then what do you do? Well, the answer is that you um, create financial incentives for people to actually spend the time to look into it and do the research and find all of that material that might not have been 
easily accessible to the patent office. This is a procedure called inter-parties review, in which we allow third parties who have strong interest in certain patents who realize that these are the important patents that potentially impact their business or their community or their stakeholders, to put in the time and effort to find that prior art that the patent office couldn't find and bring it to them and say, hey, you know, if you'd actually done your job correctly, you could have canceled this patent or you wouldn't have issued this patent in the first place. That's really, I think that's one of the key motivations behind why um, this program exists allowing the patent office to reconsider its applications because it knows it's limited in its capabilities, both because of the access issues and because of the legal issues and because of the time issues. Um, so, you know, I think that that's why we've seen, um, we've seen a lot of companies try to take advantage of this because they realize, you know, the patent office isn't perfect um, and the free market is better at identifying what are the real problems that need to be addressed. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of reason to believe that more information is better and that's actually one of the ways that the patent office has found to get more information. Yeah. I just wanted to piggyback off what Charles just said and just maybe take it a little bit further in terms of what you're talking about information. Um, one of the things we found in working around the world is actually having a mechanism, because the IPR process, the inter-parties review is after the patent is granted. Uh, many countries can actually you do it before the patent is granted. So you can file observations. There's a protest thing that you can do in the United States, but it's not very effective at all. It's, it's almost like you're protesting before you even know what the actual patent is about, which makes no sense to me, but anyway. Um, but you can actually challenge patents before they're granted, and that actually almost goes to the free market principle of actually keeping the market open until you're then effectively given that right. Uh, and I think that would be an effective way of actually making sure that patents don't get granted until they've gone through this rigorous process. Some people have called it a gold patent standard or whatever you want to call it. That, in a way, because once a patent's granted, then it's actually presumed valid, and then it's a harder task to try and turn it around. I mean, the IPR's process doesn't use that standard, but still, it's a, it's a very weighty effort to go through it. So I think, actually, taking it further, and then you can actually have all sorts of people putting in the information. Now, of course, that can be abused too, but there are ways of actually uh, um, making that uh, more um, uh, systematized, uh, and countries do it around the world, and I don't see why it couldn't be effective here. Now, it would take administrative dollars to do that, but you're saving so much more on the other end uh, in litigation and everything else and the cost of society. Uh, so um, I think, you know, what Charles says is, is, is definitely could be taken a bit further uh, and something we would advocate for because especially if there's not going to be a change in legal standard in the courts, then you need more uh, availability and channels to get more information out. And there have been various efforts at doing like peer-to-pattern pattern reviews in, in some of the software sector where you get uh, basically community people putting in evidence to the patent office. Unfortunately, those things never really took off, but uh, I think that's, that kind of stuff needs to be revisited to kind of help the patent office because, unfortunately, as we've known here, as we've heard here, patent examiners have 19 hours, and studies show that certain ex a lot of examiners have favorite prior art, which they cite over and over again, so they don't go out and look for other stuff. They just cite the same thing over and over again, and then say, yeah, my job's done. Law professors do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that close? Yeah. <laughs> same citations. <laughs> um, but I, w I wanted to ask Rachel, right, what, what does the FDA make available as far as non-approvable letters or as far as clinical trials and the results that have not been, up, you know, up to par? Right. Um, yeah, and this, this sort of comes from my experience at FDA and on the Hill. Um, there's long been a push to get more information out about the clinical trials that that are being conducted so patients know where to go and then also the results of those clinical trials. The clinicaltrials.gov database came out of the 2007 um, FDA Amendments <coughs> Act legislation and it was all about trying to get more transparency in the conduct of the clinical trials. Um, anyone who's been following that knows that hasn't lived up to the expectations of Congress and the results that are being reported are not complete. Uh, during the 21st Century Cures process, there were various uh, legislative efforts to make not only the results of clinical trials available, but also FDA's reviews of the clinical trials, more complete information about FDA's reviews available. Um, that was met with a lot of resistance from industry, raising concerns about confidential business information, confidentiality. 
Um, but I don't think there's any question that, you know, particularly when you talk about releasing more information about the information that actually goes to FDA and what FDA thinks of it, that that would just have tremendous benefits for patients. I mean, there, it would result in more efficient clinical trials, fewer patients being exposed to the risks of new drugs and testing because we would have brought out into the open information about the experience of those drugs or similar drugs in in earlier reviews and earlier submissions to the agency. So it's a really important issue. Um, I think it's something that this FDA commissioner again is interested in and you know has already started to highlight. Uh, I think it again is going to continue to be met with a lot of resistance for the, the sort of uh, confidentiality concerns that have been raised over the years unfortunately, so. Well, I'm going to waive my moderator's privilege and just ask if there are other questions from the audience. We have time for a couple more. Yeah. So just for the um, stream, this is a question about um, what are the optimal solutions, um, why hasn't Congress acted on them, and sort of how to overcome the um, resistance of the pharmaceutical lobby? Uh, so I'll, I'll tackle possibly parts of this. <laughs> Um, so I think I think you're correct that the pharmaceutical lobby um, holds a, a lot of sway over things. Um, I am still inclined to think that Congress's general desire to avoid dealing with the weird aspects of patents um, hold some degree of merit. Um, they have not carved pharma out of IPR, as pharma has been asking over the last couple of years. Um, they have not changed Section 101, which pharma has been very concerned about. Um, so, you know, I think they, they do hold a lot of persuasive power, but I think a lot of that has been to delay things in Congress rather than to push things. Um, substantive change is, is hard for any number of reasons, um, for any number of political reasons. Um, I also think that pharma has been very successful in the courts, which is why they're perfectly happy to play over there, uh, which is, again, why I think that they, the courts have ended up have, um, holding the ball on a lot of the, the key substantive issues. Um, so what I guess that gets me to is, in terms of systemic change, what's the way to do it? And you know, um, going back to something that Tahir said, you know, we can we can write. I think Rachel said this too. Um, we we can um, write all the legislation we want, but ultimately it comes down to who's interpreting it. Um, and I think a lot of the lobbying effort has gone into manipulating the bodies who interpret the law. Um, we had a very very interesting. Um, issue bubble up in the courts as to um, the Eastern District of Texas taking all of the patent cases, or taking something like 44% of the patent cases in the United States. Um, that wasn't by accident. That was because there, was, there, there were favorable pressures on judges who happened to um, take a lot of patent cases. Um, you know, you get invited to a lot of dinners, you get flown out to DC. It's a, it's a very nice little job. And um, Greg Riley's paper, um, pat, um, Forum selling, I think, documents some of these um, in, in pretty good detail. So I think that institutions are pretty important when it comes to when it comes to patents. Looking at you know who are the best institutions, you know where do issues of capture come up? How do you deal with those sorts of problems? Um, how do you disperse them? How do you take advantage of specialization versus generalization um, in order to make sure that you have bodies who know what they're doing but also aren't subject to just doing whatever industry wants them to do. Um, that, in my view, is pro if you wanted to talk about, you know, like pie in the sky, you know, very, very general um, reforms, I think that's one area that I would look pretty closely at because that has a lot of influence. Um, you know, I mentioned a couple of the more immediate uh, legislative opportunities that are out there. The PACE Act is something that is pending right now, opposing the Stronger Patents Act, those all get at the preserving the IPR system as we know it today. And I think, as we've all been talking about, that's, that's critical because it prevents invalid patents from enduring. And that's something that I think, uh, you know, is sort of a no-brainer for everyone. We are in the process of thinking about bigger solutions. I don't have any to share with you right now. As we've been talking about, 
the when you start talking about changes to the Patent Act, for example, it's incredibly complicated and affects not just one industry. And I think that makes figuring out what a legislative solution will look like very difficult. I think, you know, another another issue that we have to confront with concepts like the the one and done or just giving one period is that as we mentioned at the beginning, innovation is critical. We want there to be innovation, including valid innovation to products that are on the market now. There are a lot of, you know, tweaks that are critically important for patients and those do deserve some amount of, you know, reward. I don't know what the appropriate amount is, but that's just another sort of complexity to to think about. Whatever solution everyone, you know, comes up with and starts to think about, we have to have certainty for both brands and generics about when the time period of protection comes to an end. I think that will be critical and figuring out what the fair balance is. I think you know we're in the process now of making everyone aware of the problem that exists. And I think as that conversation goes on, solutions will become apparent, solutions that everybody can get behind. And, and we're very much in that process now. Um, well, just to try and add on what's been said already, um, I think f for me it's it's just interesting just to understand that probably why it doesn't get tackled, and you know this probably, Steve, as well, is uh, when you're exporting the IP model to the rest of the world and saying this is how development happens, this is how innovation happens, and it's then very hard to turn inside and say, <laughs> well, you know, actually, we need to change the stuff ourselves. You know, China just recently has started enacting uh, longer data exclusivity periods and uh, is, is maybe even doing patent extensions. And having worked around the world on this issue, you see the trade pressures that go on. So then I think there's there's that issue to look at as well. And you've got, multi, you've got uh, various agreements that are being signed, which then begs the question that it, once you sign up to those agreements, and it's even harder to change the law here because you're, you're having to unravel all these international agreements. Um, so I think it really has to, one has to look inside oneself and look in the mirror and say, what is it that you as a country stand for? And this goes to everyone. And that's a deeper question because, I mean, I hear the term innovation. I, I have a, I'm not going to get on my hobby horse, but I have, I have issues with that term because there's this, if you look at the, the, the words, the, the way the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization talks about it, it's like more patents means more innovation. And no, it doesn't. Uh, but that's the message that's been sent. That's what China's doing. We were just talking about this prior to uh, the, the panel starting. Uh, you know, there's, there's various incentives, which I'm not going to go into, <laughs> <laughs> or disincentives, um, to, to file more patents. And, and, and in that sense, I think really it goes back to, uh, from, my, from my perspective, I think it comes back to you really have to start determining what you're going to give these rewards for. And if that means some of these slightly more modified forms don't fit into that bracket of patenting, then we look at other ideas. So it, it, I like to use the word that we need to reshape the patent system to a different size. It's outgrown itself to this behemoth which is not doing what it should be doing. It needs to be shrunk a little bit. It needs to be brought back to size. It needs to actually focus on what is really the true inventions, the obvious the standards and all that. And I think legislation that actually specifically sets up prima facie, that say, you know, these kinds of drug patents are not going to be inventive. Now, of course, shenanigans can happen where you say, you know, unless you prove that something else exists. But it, you need to stop putting in some deterrence there to stop people from getting I actually think, as a, and maybe it sounds a bit crazy, what astounds me is when patents are invalidated, those extra years that companies <laughs> profited from those years of having those patents, I think there should be some penalty. Generics play damages when they basically, uh, if they launch aggressively or whatever, why shouldn't it be the other way around? I mean, people might say that's, that's going to harm innovation and no one's going to be incentivized. Well, they're already incentivized to have bad behavior in the current system. I mean, are we just going to keep feeding the baby that's acting badly? 
Are we so are we so basically uh, handcuffed that we can't do any changes? And so and that's why it goes to these broader issues. What is the pan system really about? Is it the progress of the arts, or is it really just some economic tool to create the idea that it creates jobs, even though the statistics show that it doesn't? But that's a different issue. <laughs> um, so with that, you know, um, I don't know, Dana. Do we should what? Okay, so I see another question, but we, we're going to be around and um, feel free to ask more questions and mingle, but um, the formal part of the program is now concluded so that people can get drinks and food. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you all for coming.